Hello. Yep, it looks like I'm turned on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Norwegian crowd. So, what energy fuels the sun? All right, so somebody said helium, somebody said hydrogen. Uh, these are elements. Uh, they, are, they might be fuels, uh, but I asked you what power powers the sun. What is the power that powers the sun? Fusion. Fusion is the power that powers the sun. The fusion of hydrogen into helium. Okay. And why does that happen in the sun? It's very high temperature. Wait now, wait, wait. The fusion is the thing that makes the high temperature. So why is the sun fusing in the first place? Big bang, no. Although that's a good guess, you get marks for guessing it. What? Gravity, someone said gravity, very good. Okay, now think about the sun. The sun is a million miles in diameter, 1,500 kilometers in diameter, all right? And it's made of hydrogen, and it's fairly dense. At the core of the sun, right, there's a small little area, about 10% of the mass of the sun, and roughly a half of million miles of hydrogen surrounded on all sides, pressing down with horrible weight. The force of gravity is terrible in there. It's deeply compressed, and it's very hot simply because of the pressure. And that heat and pressure is enough to, to cause a few hydrogen atoms to fuse. Not very many. Uh, about 400 million tons of hydrogen fuse per second, which, if you think about it, is not very much. Can you hear me back up there? OK, good. If 400 million tons of hydrogen fuse per second there's enough hydrogen in the core of the sun for 10 billion years. So the star will burn, our sun will burn at the rate it's currently burning for another, oh, five or six billion, because it's about five billion years old. Now, as the fusion in the core heats the core, the core tries to expand. But the weight surrounding it tries to compress it. So the star sits there like Atlas holding up the world in dynamic equilibrium, unable to move, expending furious amounts of energy. And all of that is caused by gravity. Fusion is just trying to resist. And that's where all the heat comes from. This is a war that the sun will eventually lose. And it will lose uh, rather spectacularly. About five billion years from now, all of the hydrogen in the core will be gone. It will start to fuse helium. The helium burns at a higher temperature, which cause, will cause the sun to expand. The sun will expand about a, a hundred times its size. What's the diameter of the sun? I told you. It's about a million miles. It's not a hard number to remember, right? about a million miles in diameter. It will grow by a factor of 100. So when it grows, it will be how big? 100 million miles in diameter. Good. How far away is the sun? Less than that. There's uh, a good chance that we will be inside the sun uh, on that strange day, or perhaps we'll be skating around the outside of the sun, or maybe we'll have been clever enough to move the Earth uh, maybe out to the orbit of Jupiter. That would probably be warm enough. In either case, this is serious global warming, not the kind that uh, we're debating right now. Our uh, course today for the next uh, hour or so is on the solid principles of object-oriented design. This is a course I have been teaching. Well, you can see the dates up there. 1998 is the copyright. Actually, I've been teaching this probably since 1995. Uh, uh, finally, someone's listening. What is, um, what is object orientation? We've been doing it now for a very long time. So what is it? What is all this OO stuff, really? What's it all about? Encapsulation, good word. Yeah, you get a point for that word. What else? 
Abstraction, good words. These are good words. Yeah, encapsulation, abstraction, great. What else? Representation, this is very good. Okay, let me ask the question differently. Why do we do it? Why are we so interested in objects? How come all of our language nowadays are object-oriented? What makes us think that object orientation is a good idea? What's that? E easiness. What world are you living in? Easiness? How many of you thought C was easier than, than uh, Java or C sharp? How many of you thought VB before it had all that object stuff was easier? It's much easier to do pro you know, pro pro uh, procedural programming. All you have is if statements and while loops and a few functions. And then they add all this complicated stuff, inheritance and classes and private and protected and all this polymorphic stuff. It's not easier. It's complicated, this OO stuff. Oh, maybe it makes certain other things easier. What might it make easier? If we add all this complication, inheritance and polymorphism and all that stuff, we must be getting something back. Solving complex problems, interesting. Uh, do we solve more complex problems today than we solved before all this OO stuff came around? Well, maybe we do. Maybe we do. And is that because of OO? Maybe it is. Okay, so what is it about OO that allows us to solve more complex problems? Let me ask this a completely different way. What goes wrong with software? Everything. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, everything does. Uh, you have a, an application, and you dreamed it up, uh, and you thought of the design, and you managed to get the design beautiful, and you coded it, and the code was lovely, and then you shipped it and supported it, and then over time, the code rots. It begins to degrade like a piece of bad meat. Right? The months go by and the smells that come off the code get worse and worse and worse. You can tell how old a code base is by looking at the face of the developer as he opens up the code on his screen. <laughs> Why does this happen to software? Why does it rot? It's not biological materia. There, there are no bacteria that rot it. Why does code rot? Changes. Changes. Changes by what? Changes of what? Requirements. Those doggone customers. <laughs> if they would just leave our systems alone, it would work just fine. But no, they have to change the requirements on us. And that makes our code rot. Why does it make our code rot? Why does the change make our code rot? Bad design. Ah, bad design of the change or bad design initially? Both. Well, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What changes are going to happen? You don't know. So how can you design for changes you don't know? You can't. Thank you for answering my question so forthrightly. I mean, not Norwegian, are you? So you can't design for changes that you don't know are coming. You don't know where these changes are going to come from. And so the initial design cannot be completely blamed. And yet, we are responsible as designers, as developers, for creating systems that can be changed. And it is change that rots our systems, and somehow we have to deal with that. So now let me, just, let me do this a little differently. What is the symptom? of a rotten piece of code. How do you know that the code is rotten? What? Eh? It's rigid. What does that mean, rigid? Difficult to change. Your boss comes to you and says, I want, I want you to make this change. Uh, there's a bug. And we've seen this bug, and I want you to fix the bug. And, and as you listen to the bug, you realize that you know where the bug is. You were in that module not too long ago. And you know the line of code where the bug is. So you give your boss uh, the standard estimate, six weeks. Right? You're not allowed to give an estimate less than six weeks because your other, your other programmers will come to you with clubs. So you say six weeks, fine. And, and he goes away happy. He got the minimum estimate. And now you, 
You go to your laptop, you open it up, you go to the module, you scroll to the bug, there it is. You see it. It's on the screen. And you change the code to fix the bug, and you save the file, and you compile it, and you're about to execute it, and you think, wait, if I change that line of code, there's this other module over here that calls it. I'll bet I'm going to have to make a change over here. And you open that one up, and sure enough, you're going to have to fiddle with that one a little bit. And then you think, wait. If I change that one, there's these modules over here, and you start the process of chasing your tail around the code. Six weeks go by, seven weeks, eight weeks go by. Every module in the system has been changed. You haven't been gotten a clean compile in weeks. Your boss comes to you and says, I thought you were going to be done with this in six weeks. And you say, well, it was a lot more complicated than I thought. That's rigid. That code is rigid. One change leads to another, which leads to another. And what is it that causes this chain of change? Tight coupling, dependency. I've had the word on the board there for a good long time now. Dependencies, dependencies between the modules is what causes that chain of change to take place through the code. The thing that OO gives us is the power to manage dependencies. We could talk all day long about all the other things that OO might be good at. Like, we might talk about how it's good at modeling the real world. Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not, I don't care. What it is good at is allowing us to manage the dependencies between modules. And we can manage those dependencies through an operation that we'll talk about a little bit later. I call it dependency inversion where every dependency in the system can be turned around 180 degrees if we want to. Something that you cannot do in procedural programming, but you can do in object-oriented programming. In procedural programming, the source code dependencies point in the direction of execution. When you call a function, the caller knows about the callee. But when you call a function in an object-oriented language, the callee has no idea where it got called from, and the caller does not know who it's calling. We have been able to turn that dependency around to break it. So we, as designers and architects, can choose which dependencies we wish to turn around at certain points, where to apply inversion of dependency so that we can break the chain of coupling through our modules. And that was all one slide. I actually managed to talk uh, about a number of slides here, but uh, I'll just keep on going. Uh, we talked about rigidity. Rigidity is one of the symptoms of, of poor design. Another uh, symptom of poor design is fragility. Fragility is the tendency of the code to silently and mysteriously break in strange places when you change it in other places. You go and you find a bug and, or you add a new feature in one module over here and some completely different part of the system breaks for utterly strange reasons. Uh, who's had this happen to them? When, the, yeah. <laughs> when this happens, managers look at us like we are fools. Wait, what? You changed that over there and that broke? What kind of system is this? How could that have happened? How could you have designed a system where you touch it here and it breaks over there? Oh, we are in terrible trouble. It happens all the time, but people looking on the outside in believe that under the hood things must be terrible. And maybe they're right. I worked on a system once where we had uh, uh, a whole bunch of terminals, uh, ASCII terminals. There were like 24 of them. Uh, and, and people would type uh, uh, menus on these things. So you'd, in order to execute the functions of the system, you would type 1 to go to the first level of the menu. And then a new menu would pop up, and you'd type 3 to go to the next. Voice systems do this now. Computer systems usually don't. But back in those days, that was what was on our terminal. Deep down in the menu structure, there was a misspelling. The word progress was spelled with a C, process. We had all seen this misspelling, and we thought, oh, that's a shame. But no one ever bothered to fix it, and it lasted for years. 
And then I happened to be in the module one day, just by accident, scrolling through on my screen. And I saw the word there, progress, and I said, oh, and I changed it to process. I compiled it. It compiled. I executed it. It worked. And then I made the biggest mistake of my life. I shipped it. What I did not know was that our customers, guided by the wisdom of our marketing department, had, told, had built systems of their own to hook into our terminal ports and execute our systems by reading the menus and interpreting them. Now, forget the stupidity of this idea. They had copied our menu structure into their code, and of course, they copied the spelling error with that. So when I fixed the spelling error, their systems broke. And all of our customers were calling at the same moment on the same day. And our operators were going crazy. And my boss came to me saying, what the hell did you do? I said, I fixed the spelling error. Well, don't ever do that. <laughs> this is fragile. <laughs> I fixed the spelling error and you know, terrible problems occurred. That is another symptom of poor dependency management. Uh, yet another one is code that is not reusable. Of course, the word reuse is, has gotten a very bad rap. We used to think that, oh, all this OO stuff would give us reuse. And then we found out that it didn't give us any reuse at all. And, and now people talk about reuse, and they have to mumble it under their breath. Uh, well, we, we tried to get reuse, but uh, yeah, that didn't work too well. Anybody here ever try to write a reusable library? Sorry. Turns out to be a bad idea. We didn't mean to get you into such trouble. Most reusable libraries did not turn out to be reusable. Most re reusable libraries didn't turn out to be usable. Right? We trended to think about them in great abstract terms and build massive abstractions. And, and then everybody looked at them and said, I'm not using that. <sighs> the, uh, there was a, um, a wonderful statement. I think it was Jarno Strustrup who finally made it. He said, the best aspect of a reusable library is that it first be usable. And then once it's usable, you might be able to get it to be reusable. I've talked about rigidity. I've talked about fragility. I've talked about all this stuff. I won't talk about the trailer. Maybe later. Dependency management. Dependency management is the practice of partitioning our design into I'll, for lack of a better word, I'll use components. De partition our design into components and manage the dependencies such that the components don't depend on each other uh, arbitrarily. They depend upon each other in very strict ways and in very strict di directions. Uh, I use this uh, idea of a um, uh, brick wall where we can take the bugs and put walls around them so a bug in this part of the code cannot leak out into that part of the code. Uh, we build firewalls in the source code structure of the system so that there's no way a change on one side of the system can propagate all the way to the other side of the system. We manage our dependencies to prevent that from happening. Let's look at how a system might rot. This is a very small system, and we're going to watch it rot over a period of a few weeks. Uh, we'll speed up time for you so that you don't have to sit here for a couple of weeks. Uh, the case here is that your boss comes to you and says, got a new function for you to write. It's got to copy characters from the keyboard to the printer. That's all. Now you think, well, this is six lines of code. So you give him the minimum estimate Good, six weeks. Boss goes away perfectly happy, and now you start to think about this. Ah, what is this system going to look like? Well, and of course, all good developers draw pictures. It's a requirement of developers. They must draw pictures before they do anything else. So we draw a picture of this, and we realize that, well, we'll probably need a copy loop. This will just be a little module up at the top that loops around. And what it's going to do is call the keyboard function and get a character. And then it's going to call the printer module to copy the character to the printer. And the copy loop will probably test for end of file. That's Monday. Monday we draw that picture. And we'd like to keep working because this took us 15 minutes. 
But uh, there's a new guy who started in our company. We have to go train him. It'll take all day. Tuesday, we write the code. Here's the six lines of code. Uh, easy to write. We managed to type it in. Takes us about five minutes to type it in. We'd like to compile it, but there's a bug in the field. We have to go fix it. Takes all day. Wednesday, we compile it. Compiles first time. Good thing to, there's some cross-functional meeting we've got to go to. Takes all day. Thursday, we test it. Uh, works first time. No problems at all. Takes us about 10 minutes to test it. Good thing to, because there's some quality meeting we've got to go to. Takes all day. Friday, no meetings, no nothing. The whole schedule is clear. We've got the entire day. Good thing, too. It takes us all day to get this into the source code control system. <laughs> we have five weeks left. Do we tell anybody? No. We've got a lot of other stuff to do, too. Meetings to go to and people to train and bugs to fix. So at the six-week boundary, we go to our boss and say, I got this module done now. I think it works. And the boss takes it. We win awards for this code. And hundreds of other programmers begin to use it. It's possibly the most successful software that's ever been written at our company, this six lines of code. Massive numbers of people are calling this code. We have a big party about it. It's wonderful. Oh, the copy function. Sometime later, our boss comes to us and says, you know, that program you wrote, what a killer app. You deserve that promotion you got for that. Now, listen, sometimes we need it not to read from the keyboard. Sometimes we need it to read from the paper tape reader. Anybody know what a paper tape reader is? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, never mind that. We need it to sometimes read from the paper tape reader. So we think about it for a while, and we give our boss the minimum estimate. Six weeks, good. He goes away, perfectly happy. And now we think, okay, how are we going to make this happen? Or how are we going to make it so that you can call this function and sometimes it'll read from the paper tape reader? And what we'd like to do, I'll go back to the original, what we'd like to do is put a Boolean there. Boolean, if true, read from the paper tape reader, but if false, read from the keyboard. But we don't dare put that Boolean there. We can't put the Boolean there. Why not? Hundreds of other programmers are already using this code. We can't change the signature of the function. If, they, if we change the signature of that function, they'll all have to recompile and retest, and they'll all submit estimates of six weeks each, and this won't get done for decades. So we can't change the signature, but what we can do is use a global. There's always a way to get data into a function. Just a nice little global here called the G tape reader global. We will initialize it to false. Uh, the idea here is, is that in the while loop, if the G tape reader global is true, we will read from the tape. Otherwise, we'll read from the keyboard. So that works nicely for us. The best best operator in the C family of languages is the question colon argument. Our operator. You can put whole if statements into an expression. The idea here is that the people who want to use the tape reader must set the variable to true, then call copy, and then they'd better set it to false later. Because otherwise somebody else will get in trouble. So we're going to cover our butts here by putting a comment in. right? Remember to clear it. No one can blame us that we didn't warm you. <laughs> Sometime later, our boss comes to us and says, you know, sometimes we'd like it to write to the paper tape punch. Well, we've got a design pattern for this now. We know how to solve this. Just another global. Another question mark colon operator. We're on our way. That didn't take six weeks, but we can't tell anybody. Now, this code is clearly rotting. Two changes to the requirements, and already we've got a whole bunch of new dependencies. We depend on the tape reader. We depend on the keyboard. We depend on the punch. We depend on the printer. And the, then the dependencies are accumulating every time there's a new change. You can imagine what's going to happen over the next several months as our boss comes to us and says, oh, yeah, sometimes we'd like it to read from the optical character reader, and sometimes we'd like it to write to the speech synthesizer, and we put more and more of these variables in and more and more of these questions. That was my water. 
it rebelled. It knew that it had to get out of this company. And that's what's going to happen once this module grows to about a thousand lines. We're going to look at it and go, I can't maintain this anymore. Time to get a new job. Let some other guy take care of this sucker. It's not the way it had to happen, however. Had, our, had we thought a little bit differently about this module when our boss came to us initially, we might have written it like that. Now, in this case, we're calling getchar and putchar. Uh, this is old Unix library stuff. What does uh, getchar do in the old Unix library? Gets a character from standard input. And what's standard input? Whatever. But it defaults to the keyboard, console. Uh. So it works the same way as the first code we wrote. And putchar, that puts a character to standard output, which defaults to the printer. So this code works exactly the way our first version did. But this code behaves differently when our boss comes to us and says that he wants it to read from the paper tape punch. Because when he asks us to make that change, we have an option. We could tell him, or we could say six weeks. And during that six weeks, we would have to do Nothing, because this will already read from the paper tape reader. It will already write to the paper tape punch. All that, all that has to be done is for the callers to change standard in and standard out appropriately. This code does not rot when the requirements change. Now, what's interesting about that is that the difference between this function and the original function, which was there, is two words, that word and that word. Otherwise, they're identical. Why would changing two words utterly change the way this program responded to change? Why do those two words prevent this code from rotting? I broke the dependencies on keyboard and printer. Uh, and no matter what happens, as I add more and more new devices, no new dependencies will be added to this module. Why? What is so magic about that word? What's so magic about the word getchar that it prevents the addition of new dependencies? It's the word is generic, the word is abstract. Very good. These are abstractions. Abstractions. I have changed the copy function to use abstractions instead of using detail. Now, interestingly enough, this is an object-oriented program. It doesn't look like one because it's written in C. But I want you to think about what getchar and putchar really are. They are polymorphic functions on a class named file. Inside that class named file, written in C, there is a jump table. That jump table, although it's not a C++ V table, looks an awful lot like a C++ V table because it routes to the right device driver through the same mechanism that any other polymorphic dispatch would. This is a polymorphically dispatched object-oriented program written in C. And the reason that it does not rot it is because it took advantage of that polymorphism to change the dependency structure. We're going to talk an awful lot about this kind of dependency structure over the next eh, tw 35 minutes. We're going to go through a set of principles that talk about this kind of dependency structure. Uh, we could rewrite this code in oh some language that's kind of like C sharp and kind of like Java, but is neither. Uh, here is the loop. It's inside a class named copy. There are interfaces named reader and writer that have read and write functions. Uh, there is a constructor that takes a reader and a writer. And our loop has no idea which devices it is using. It's simply reading from the reader and writing to the writer. Uh, the dependency structure looks like this. The copy code depends on interfaces. The device drivers depend on the interfaces as well. Compare that. to this, where the copy program depended directly on the 
keyboard and the printer. Notice the direction of those dependencies. The drivers were depended upon, whereas here, the drivers do the depending. This is inversion. This is dependency inversion, where we take the lowest level details that usually would be depended upon, and we turn those dependencies around so that they do the depending instead of being depended upon. This inversion is the key to keep code from rotting. So now, let's take a look at some of the principles that take advantage of that particular kind of dependency management. There are five of them that we're going to talk about today. I hope I get through them all. They, if you spell them out in a certain order, they, they create the word solid. We didn't know this until a few years ago. Michael Feathers one day just said, you know, if you switch them around a little bit, they spell solid. So we switched them around. That seemed to have been a good idea. The first one is the single responsibility principle. The single responsibility principle says that a class should have one and only one reason to change. Now, maybe we should have called it the single change principle or, or something like that. But the name has been chosen a long time ago. I don't think we're going to change it anytime soon. The single responsibility means that this class, employee, should only have one reason to change. Now take a look at that class employee. It has a number of interesting methods. The calc pay method, which computes pay for employees. These are the business rules. And then we have the report hours function, which builds a report uh, for the accountants people uh, of the uh, hours worked by the employees. This, this function here uh, returns strings in a certain format that can be added in to a report. And finally, the write employee function, which saves the employee to the database. How many reasons does this class have to change? Three. And those three reasons, very simply, if the business rules change, this class will change. If the format of the report changes, this class will change. If the schema of the database changes, this class will change. Those three things are utterly unrelated. The schema of the database, the format of the report, and the business rules that calculate pay. Completely unrelated, but we have coupled them together by putting them in the same class. So that when the business rules change, everybody who calls the employee to get a report out will be affected. When the format of the report changes, everybody who calls the employee to calculate pay will be affected. How are they affected? They're affected in the build. The build will force you to recompile classes that depend upon employee. And if any of the methods of employee change, all the incoming dependencies force a wave of builds to go out. Uh, deployment, if you want to put these classes in specific DLLs and deploy them independently. Anybody depending upon calc pay needs to be deployed with the employee. Anybody depending upon remote report hours needs to be deployed in the same DLL or at least at the same time. So we have a, a wide range of incoming dependencies because employee does too much. Now you think, yeah, but wait a minute. These are perfectly good methods on class employee. Isn't this where we're supposed to put methods? Aren't we supposed to put methods into objects which, which deal with the variables of those objects? The answer is yes, of course you are. But you also have to put them in classes that can be independently deployed and that don't cause, cause massive build thrashing. So what we want to do here is split this class up into three different classes. One that calculates pay, another that reports hours, and another that writes employees. Does that mean that you have to have a separate class for every method? No. You need to have a separate class for every group of methods that changes for a different reason. If you've got a whole bunch of reports that all have report formats that they control, well, you'll probably put all of them in the same 
same area, same class or same group of classes. If you have a whole bunch of business rules, you'll put them in the same class or the same area. If you have a bunch of database stuff, you'll put them in separate classes. I would like to see this class split up into three. What I would like to see is an employee class, which knows how to calculate pay, a report class, which uses the employee and knows how to format the report, and another class entirely that uses the employee and knows how to write the employee to the database. I don't want the employee object to ever know that a database exists. I don't want the employee object to ever know that a report exists. I want the employee object only to know that the business rules exist. You can see what I'm after here. We have a payroll application. Payroll application uses employee. It does all the calculation of pay. There are probably many methods involved with calculate pay, not just one. We've got a report writer that uses the employee and it writes the report. We've got an employee repository which uses the employee and writes the, writes the employee out to the database. And now, when the format of the report changes, that class changes, but not this one and not that one. When the database schema changes, this class changes, but not that one and not this one. And when the business rules change, that one changes. And maybe there's a little bit of impact on those two. We might even want to take these out and make them separate just to keep them all isolated from each other. That's the single responsibility principle. And someone once said that you could, you could describe all of these principles just by twisting the single responsibility principle around. By the way, I think that's true of all these principles. You can phrase each one of them in terms of the others because they're all really driving at the same fundamental idea, manage your dependencies somehow. The second principle, it's called the open-closed principle, and it's probably the oldest of these principles. It was invented by Bertrand Meyer a good long time ago. I think it was 1988. And I don't know if the word invented is right or perhaps the word discovered. Who knows who Bertrand Meyer is? A few of you. Who's heard of the language Eiffel? More of you. He, he invented the language Eiffel. Okay. He also wrote one of the best books out there on software development uh, in the 80s. It was called Object-Oriented Software Construction. A wonderful book that described a whole suite of wonderful principles. He used the language Eiffel in that book, which was a bit unfortunate because nobody knows the language. But the stuff in that book was very, very good, very high content. One of the things he said in that book was this. He had this principle called the open-closed principle, which says modules should be open for extension but closed for modification. Open for extension means that you can change the module. Closed for modification means that you don't have to change the module. Wait. Open for extension means that you can add things, extend. You can change the behavior. Closed for modification means you can do that without changing the source code. Now that sounds weird. How can you change the behavior of a module without changing its source code? But you can. We've already done it with the copy program. The copy program had a nice little loop in it. And that nice little loop had no idea that it was going to be calling the paper tape reader or the printer or the keyboard. I was able to create new I.O. drivers and change what that high-level loop did, and I didn't even have to recompile the high-level loop. I could change what it did. I could extend its function without modifying its code. That's what the open-close principle is all about. Let's use the ability of polymorphism to take one, app, one algorithm and set it aside so that it doesn't have to change when these things over here do. Then we can extend what this module does by adding new derivatives of something. Abstraction, of course, is the key. When you're, doing, when you're trying to follow the open-closed principle, abstraction is the key. Imagine that your entire code base followed this principle perfectly. This, by the way, is impossible, but let's assume that it could. 
If you could get all of your code to follow the open-close principle, then when you had to add a new feature, you would not have to change any existing code. You would just add new code. Because to extend the functionality of your system would not require you to modify any of the existing classes. You could extend without modifying. So if you were perfect at this, every new feature, every new addition, everything you did would be done by adding new code, not by changing old code. Now, it's not possible to get a, a system to fully conform to this, but what if you could get it to, oh, 50% conform to it? That would mean that when you added new features, most of the code would be in new code, not fiddling around with old code. How many of you have gotten completely lost trying to add a feature to a massive system by fiddling around with 500 different modules? Wouldn't it be nice if you could just put it all in one module? Ah, oh, there's the new feature, goes in one module. Uh -huh. So, let's see how that might work. The typical connection between two parts of a piece of software, two modules in software, looks like this. The client calls the server. And if the client calls the server and depends directly in the server, then any change to the server impacts the client. Now, what if I've got a new feature I want to add? And it's a new way for the, for the uh, client to use the server. Some different mechanism in the server that the client can use. I could do that by putting an if statement in the client and having it call a slightly different server. Or I could do it this way. I could create an abstract server, have the client call the abstract server, and derive all my two different servers from the abstract server. If I do it the first way, I must change the client. I must put the if statement in. If I do it the second way, the client remains utterly unchanged. How many of you saw uh, Michael Feather's talk yesterday where he was talking about small talk and the way Boolean was implemented? Right? This was a fascinating discussion because he demonstrated that all if statements in small talk made no decisions at all. They just polymorphically deployed to a Boolean class that called either the true branch or the false branch. The decision was not made at the time of the if statement. The decision was made at the time the Boolean was created, much different time. It's very similar to what's happening here. Here, we would make the decision every time we wanted to call the server. Here, the decision is made when the server is created. Let's say that I, um, I create a completely new kind of server. It, does, it does the follows the same interface, but it does a whole bunch of different things following the same interface. The client is utterly unaffected. The client doesn't even need to be recompiled. It doesn't need to be redeployed if you do it well. You can just ship a new server. This is the open-close principle. Now let's take a look at it in some detail. And let's see, I, let's look at, I think I've got a couple of different languages here. No, I don't. What language is this? Who recognizes this? Yep, it's definitely C++ because it's got an enum. I don't think C has an enum or does it? Does now? Uh, okay, I'm using struct. Uh, well, maybe it's C. Maybe it's C++, who cares? It's one of those languages. I've got a file here named shape.h. Shape.h begins with an enum. The enum is of type shape type. There's a circle and square enumerator. There's a data structure in here named shape. It has one element, which is the enum. I have a file named circle.h. It has a struct circle. It begins with an enum, just like the shape did, begins with an enum. We're going to use this to our advantage shortly. This is the old C hacker's trick to make m different data structures look alike. Uh, the data structure also has a radius and a center point, and it defines a function called draw circle, which takes a pointer to a circle. So you want to draw a circle, you create one of these things, and you pass the circle into draw circle. Uh, there's a file called square.h. It has a data structure named square, uh, an enumeration named shape type, same as all of these, enum shape type. Uh, it defines the side and the top left point, and a draw square function as before. And now we have the uh, draw all shapes function. 
The draw all shapes function lives in a file named draw all shapes dot C, which pound includes all of these. I use pound include in this example because in C++, that is a very, very tight coupling. In C sharp, using in Java import, they're not nearly as tight, but they are still bad enough. This draw all shapes takes a list of shape pointers. It loops through the list of shape pointers. It asks each data structure in the list what its type is. And if it's a square, it calls draw square. If it's a circle, it calls draw circle. Now, what kind of changes are likely to occur to this application? Add a new kind of shape, triangle. OK, let's add a new kind of shape, a triangle. Uh, what's the first line of code we're going to change? That one. We're going to add triangle to the enum, which lives in shape.h. Who pound includes shape.h? Everybody. So everybody has to recompile. Everybody has to be redeployed. There's something fundamentally sick about the fact that circle has to be recompiled because we're adding a triangle. Something very wrong with this. Right? This is rigid. The fact that we've got to make changes in lots of places and rebuild a whole bunch of stuff is rigid. It's hard to add the triangle. We're going to have to add the triangle data structure. Then we're going to have to go over here and add the triangle case. Now, you might think, well, that's not a big problem. But in fact, it is a big problem because this is not the only such switch case statement in this system. This one is draw all shapes. But there's also drag all shapes, erase all shapes, rotate all shapes, shift all shapes, shrink all shapes. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of functions, and they all have this switch statement in them, except that they don't all have that switch statement in them because some of the programmers didn't write it as a switch statement. Some of them wrote it as an if-else statement. And some of them may have written it as a switch statement but changed the ordering of these. And then there were the clever programmers who realized that they didn't have to put all the cases in. For example, rotate all shapes. How do you rotate a circle? You don't. We're going to have to go through every one of these, determine how logically to add the triangle, and we're going to fail at this. This is fragile. It's highly likely that it will break. It's fragile. But the worst case, the worst situation, is not the fact that it's rigid and fragile. The worst situation is this. Our business has suddenly decided that they're going to give this away for free. But they're going to charge their customers for squares and circles. They want to put square and circle in separate DLLs and charge money for them, but they'll give you this DLL for free. And now you as programmers have to tell the business, we can't do that because this code depends directly on that code. There's no way to put it in separate DLLs. Or if you did put it in separate DLLs, there's no way to deploy them separately. Separating them into different DLLs would be worthless. They're not independently deployable. That's the real hardship here because it affects the business model. Now we can't charge for circle and square. We're going to have to change the structure of our code. And how do we do that? How do we do it like this? Even in C++, it's possible to do this. We're just going to create a new class called shape. It will have a draw function. That draw function will be abstract. That's what the little equals zero means in C++ means abstract. We'll have a square class that derives from shape. It has a draw function. A circle class derives its shape. It's got a draw function. And now, are you ready for the lie? Here comes the big lie. Draw all shapes. We'll take a list of shapes. It will loop through the shapes, telling each shape to draw itself. And life will be wonderful. Now, let's go through the rigid, fragile, and uh, deployable scenarios. When we add a triangle to this, what's the first line of code we're going to change? Here. Nothing. Nothing. No code here changes when we add triangle. Oh, code changes somewhere. Somewhere in the system, someone must create the triangles. None of this changes. None of this has to be recompiled. This is not rigid. And it's not fragile because all of the functions like draw and rotate and scale and erase and shift will all be methods of the shape class. There's no way you can miss any of them. 
The compiler won't compile unless you implement them. So it's not going to be fragile either. And best of all, I can put square in a DLL, circle in a DLL, draw all shapes in a DLL, and I can ship them independently of each other. It would be perfectly valid for me to put this DLL and that DLL into the, into the whole application and run it with just squares, or run it with just circles, or run it with just circles and triangles but not squares, and it would execute just fine. So it's independently deployable. This is the benefit of the open-close principle. But I just got done telling you that this was a lie. Why is this a lie? This looks nice, doesn't it? I mean, this is a nice real-world model. We've got shapes, and shapes might be squares and circles. This is, this is a nice model. It protects us from what? What does it protect us from? New shapes. What if that's not what the customers change? What if the customers come along and say, yeah, we really like this, but um, we'd like you to draw all the squares first and then all the circles second? We didn't expect you to make that change. That's going to change. That's going to mess up everything. Now I'm going to have to have two loops. And I'm going to have to put if statements in those loops. And the if state, what are the if statements going to be? They're going to be, they're going to be instance of statements. They're going to be dynamic cast statements. They're going to be testing whether or not this shape is a square. And I'll do that one first. And then the, the customers chose a change that was not in line with our model. Our model protects us only from one thing, new kinds of shapes. If that's not the way the customers decide to change it, then this design buys us nothing. In fact, it gets in the way. This is the fundamental problem with all object-oriented design. In order to do it well, you must be able to predict the future. And none of us can predict the future. So we wind up trying to figure out what changes are likely to be made and put abstractions into our applications. And we hope one day that some of them will be made. And then we lie to ourselves. We say, oh, a change happened that we expected. We're so happy we put those abstractions in, ignoring the 7,000 other abstractions that no one has ever taken advantage of, but that we must maintain. So I recommend a slightly different view. I do not want you to go thinking in your mind, oh, I must follow the open-close principle, and therefore I must think of every possible change that might happen and implement all the abstractions forever and ever that will prevent this change. What I want you to do instead is take a very pragmatic view. Imagine that you are a sergeant in charge of a squad of soldiers, and that squad of soldiers is looking out over a field where the enemy lives. And you don't know where the enemy is. Somewhere out there. Right? You don't know where. If you just knew where, you could concentrate your fire in that direction. So you say, Johnson, stand up. <laughs> and then you know where the fire is coming from, and you concentrate your fire. I want you to write your applications as simply as possible. I want them not to take advantage of every possible abstraction in the world. I want you to write them simply and easily and then put them in front of customers as soon as possible, users and testers, so that they start saying, oh, I think I want to change it this way and that way. And then you know where to put the changes. Then you know where to put the abstractions. The, the abstractions you create protect you from changes that have already happened because those are the most likely changes to happen again. When are we done with this one? Quarter two? Sounds good to me. The Liskov substitution principle. The Liskov substitution principle was invented by Barbara Liskov in 1988. I won't quote the real principle because it uses a lot of mathematical terms. Instead, I will paraphrase it by saying that derived classes must be usable through the base class without the need for the base class to know the difference. Another way to say that is, is that when you create a derivative, it's got to be substitutable for the base. Any place you use a base, you should be able to use a derivative. It's a very simple idea, but it has very interesting ramifications. Here is the first one. Imagine that I have a class named rectangle. 
What are the fields of rectangle? Height and width. Right? And uh, uh, what are the functions of rectangle? Set height, set width. Fine. And imagine that we've had this class for, oh, several years, and we've been very happy with it. And then our boss comes to us and says, you know, sometimes we need a square. Okay, fine. What is the relationship between square and rectangle? Well, everybody knows that a square is a rectangle. And if you've been studying software for any length of time, you know that is a means inheritance. So square will inherit from rectangle because square is a rectangle. Now, right away, there's problems with this. Right away. How many variables does a rectangle have? Two. How many does a square need? One. How many will it inherit? Two. Something's wrong. The square is too big. It's got too much data in it. But we can hide that. We can hide that. We can, we can implement the square set width and set height functions to make sure that whenever you set the width on a square, it also sets the height. What functions are going to be inherited from rectangle into square? Set height and set width. What does that mean? When you call set width on a square, what does that mean? Set side. Wouldn't it be nice if there were a set side function up here? Oh, no, it wouldn't. We don't want a set side function up in a rectangle. We would like a set side function down in square, but what we get to inherit is set height and set width. This doesn't fit very well. The, the abstraction doesn't work very well, but we can force it to work by doing this. And having done this, we pride ourselves by saying, OK, we've managed to clean up this abstraction. It works. There's no way for a square to ever be not be a square. There's no way for a rectangle never not to be a rectangle. Everything's fine. And now we have some poor user, some guy over here who uses rectangle. And this poor user of rectangle calls set width. Does he have the right to expect that the height doesn't change? Yeah. He's calling a rectangle. You call set width on a rectangle, the height should not change. And yet if we pass him a square, the height will change. And he will corrupt his heap. And a billion instructions later, he will crash. And you will have to get a logic analyzer out and debug for weeks. And you will finally find, as you were debugging for weeks and weeks, you will find out that the reason the system crashed is because somebody passed you a square. And what are you going to do when you realize that someone passed you a square? What code are you going to put in your system to protect yourself from someone passing you a square? An if statement. An if statement with an is a in it. If this is a square, which means you're going to hang a dependency on square, violating the open close principle. This, this violation of substitutability, the fact that square is not really substitutable for a rectangle, will wind up forcing you to write an if statement, which will violate the open close principle. And you'll wind up with software that must be changed and that is rigid and fragile and cannot be deployed. Why did this happen? Isn't a square a rectangle? Yeah, a square is a rectangle. That's not a square. That's a piece of code. This is not a rectangle. That's a piece of code. They're not squares and rectangles. They're just representing squares and rectangles. Now, when you get a divorce, you have a lawyer representing you, and your spouse has a wife representing them. Uh, it is not the two lawyers that are getting a divorce. These are the representatives of a square and, and rectangle. They are not squares and rectangles. And so the relationship is a between a square and rectangle does not hold between the representatives. What is this relationship really, this inheritance relationship? Is it really an is a relationship? It's better to think of it as a behaves-like relationship. Uh, let's take another example, a much more, much more interesting one. Consider the class integer. How many bits in it? Yeah, it depends. OK, pick a number. 32, good. 32-bit integer. Now, are there real numbers in this system? An integer is a real number. So we could have a class named real, and integer could inherit from real. How is a real number represented? 
Well, it's represented as a set of integers. You know, there's the mantissa and the exponent and a couple of different signs. But that's okay. We could still represent the... Now, the, all of that representation would be inherited into the integer, but okay, fine. Every real number is a complex number. So we could have a, an inheritance relationship from real to complex. What's in a complex number? Two real numbers. The real part and the imaginary part. Go ahead and write this code. Right? See if you can compile it. You can't. It will go into an infinite compile loop because of this self-reference. There is no way to express that in code. You can express it in UML just fine. You just can't express it in code, which also says that UML is a language that doesn't correspond perfectly to code. Uh, you know that you are violating this principle if you write derivatives that try not to do what the base class does. There are functions in the base class that you don't want called in the derivative. That's what's going to force people to use if statements later on. If you have a function in a base class and in the derivative you rewrite it to do nothing, sneakily hiding that it even exists, uh, eventually someone will have to write an if statement. Or if you are mo more overt about it and you write a function in the base class and then in the derivative you write it to throw an exception, don't call me. Other people will have to write if statements so that they don't get the don't call me uh, exception. All of these are violations of this principle. In short, if you ever try to make a derivative that can do less than the base, then you are violating this principle. And it is not at all obvious on the surface that there are these substitution violations. You have to study them very carefully. I think we have time for one last principle, which is called the dependency inversion principle, which is the principle around which I like to rotate this whole talk. Remember the copy program, which had dependencies on read, keyboard, and write printer. Remember how we solved the way that it rotted by taking those two dependencies right there and inverting them so that they pointed away. Every object-oriented program is constructed this way. It has dependencies pointing towards abstractions. Notice how all these dependencies point at the two abstract classes. The high-level policy points at the two abstract classes. The low-level details point at the two abstract classes. That is the dependency inversion principle. And it tells us that whenever we have a dependency pointed at something abstract, if we ever mention the name of a class, Make sure it's an abstract class. If we ever call a function, make sure it is an abstract function. If we ever override a function, make sure it's an abstract function we are overriding. Don't, don't reference a concrete class. Don't call a concrete function. Don't override a concrete function if you follow this principle 100%. Now, you can't follow this principle 100%. It's impossible. Because at very least, the new keyword is going to force you to mention concrete classes. But you can structure most of your code so that it, is, it looks like this instead of that. And only one module in your system, main, can look like that. And then it can call this part, this part of the system and the rest of the system pretends as though only abstractions exist. And it is quarter two, so I think we need to stop. Is that right? So we have to stop at quarter two. Yeah. Well, okay, it's quarter two. We have to stop. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm going to be discussing component principles here, which is the next batch of principles in about 15 minutes, I think. Huh? Yep, okay. Talk to you guys. See you guys later.